ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय रीडिंग फ्रॉम श्रीमद भगवद गीता एज इट इज राइट डिफरेंस बिटवीन भगवद गीता एज इट इज एंड भगवद गीता एज इट इज इन You're all finding the difference. Translation and commentary by His Divine Grace Shula A. C. Bhakti Vedanta Swami Prabhupada. Mamai Vangsho Jiva Loke. Jiva Bhuta Sanatana Ha. Mana Shashta Nindriyani. प्रकृति स्थानी कर्षती लिविंग एंटिटीज इन दिस कंडीशन वर्ल्ड आर माई इटर्नल फ्रेगमेंटल पार्ट ड्यू टू कंडीशन लाइफ दे आर स्ट्रगलिंग वेरी हार्ड विद द सिक्स सेंसेस विच इंक्लूड द माइंड पॉट इन दिस वर्स the identity of the living being is clearly given the living entity is the fragmental part and parcel of the supreme lord eternally it is not that he assumes individuality in his conditional life and in his liberated state becomes one with the supreme lord he is eternally fragmented it is clearly said sanatana ha According to the Vedic version the supreme lord manifests and expands himself in innumerable expansions of which the primary expansions are called vishnu tattva and the secondary expansions are called the living entities in other words the vishnu tattva is the personal expansion and the living entities are the separated expansions by his personal expansion expansion He is manifested in various forms like Lord Rama, Nrsimha Dev, Vishnu Murti, and all the predominating deities in the Vaikuntha planets. The separated expansions, the living entities, are eternally servitors. The personal expansions of the supreme personality of Godhead, the individual identities of the Godhead, are always present. Similarly, the separated expansions of living entities have their identities. as fragmental parts and parcels of the supreme lord the living entities also have fragmental portions of his qualities of which independence is one every living entity as an individual soul has his personal individuality and a minute form of independence by misuse of that independence one becomes a conditioned soul and by proper use of independence he is always liberated in either case he is qualitatively eternal as the supreme lord is in his liberated state he is freed from this material condition and he is under the engagement of transcendental service unto the lord in his conditional conditioned life he is dominated by the material modes of nature and he forgets the transcendental loving service of the lord as a result he has to struggle very hard to maintain his existence in the material world the living entities not only human beings and the cats and dogs but even the greater controllers of the material world brahma lord shiva and even vishnu are all parts and parcels of the supreme lord they are all eternal not temporary manifestations the word karshati struggling or grappling hard is very significant the conditioned soul is bound up as though shackled by iron chains he is bound up by the false ego and the mind is the chief agent which is driving him in this material existence when the mind is in the mode of goodness his, his activities are good when the mind is in the mode of passion his activities are troublesome and when the mind is in the mode of ignorance he travels in the lower species of life it is clear however in this verse that the conditioned soul is covered by the material body 
with the mind and the senses. And when he is liberated, this material covering perishes, but his spiritual body manifests itself in its individual capacity. The following information is there in the Madhyanandayana Shruti. Sava Esha Brahmanishta Edang Sharirang Martyam Ati Sridja Brahma Bhi Sampadya Brahmana Pashati Brahmana Shunoti Brahmana Vedang Sarvam Anubhavati. It is stated here that when a living entity gives up this material embodiment and enters into the spiritual world, he revives his spiritual body, and in his spiritual body he can see the Supreme Personality of Godhead face to face. He can hear and speak to him face to face, and he can understand the Supreme Personality as he is. From Smriti also it is understood. Vasanti yatra purushaf sarve vaikunta murtayaha In the spiritual planets everyone lives in bodies featured like the Supreme Personality of Godheads. As far as bodily construction is concerned, there is no difference between the path and past of living entities and the expansions of Vishnu Murti. In other words, at liberation, the living entity gets a spiritual body by the grace of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The words, Lamai Vangshaha, fragmental paths and parcels of the Supreme Lord, are also very significant. The fragmental portion of the Supreme Lord is not like some material broken part. We have already understood in the second chapter that the spirit cannot be cut into pieces. This fragment is not materially conceived. It is not like matter which can be cut into pieces and joined together again. That conception is not applicable here because the Sanskrit word sanatana, eternal, is used. The fragmental portion is eternal. It is also stated in the beginning of the second chapter that in each and every individual body the fragmental portion of the Supreme Lord is present. That fragmental portion, when liberated from the bodily entanglement, revives its original spiritual body in the spiritual sky in a spiritual planet and enjoys association with the Supreme Lord. It is, however, understood here that the living entity being the fragmental part and parcel of the Supreme Lord is qualitatively one with the Lord, just as the parts and parcels of gold are also gold. This is a very important verse from Bhagavad Gita. Of course, all the verses are important, but in this verse, Srila Prabhupada, sorry, Lord Sri Krishna, clearly explains what is the position of the jiva. He has explained, previous to this, the nature of the soul as eternal, immutable, and here he very clearly defines the position of the jiva in relationship with him, the Supreme Lord. And Srila Prabhupada elaborates on that in the purport, gives more explanation, that's the meaning of the purport, gives more explanation of the subject being explained. Uh, as Srila Prabhupada writes in the first line of this purport, in this verse the identity of the living being is clearly given. And then Prabhupada goes on to write that the living entity is the fragmental part and parcel of the Supreme Lord eternally. And then towards the end of the purport, he uh, qualifies the use of the term fragmental here. Uh, he, he says that it is not to be understood materially. When we hear of a fragment, we, we usually think of a, a broken part, something that's broken off. But Prabhupada qualifies the use of this term because already previously in Bhagavad Gita, it's already been stated, achedoyam, the, the soul is not breakable. This soul is not breakable. So Prabhupada is using the word fragmental. Um, the English language is not perfect. Sanskritam means, the very word Sanskrit means perfectly made. English is not so perfect, so... Prabhupada is qualifying the use of his words, explaining very carefully what is to be understood. Now, the verse, in this verse, the identity of the living being is clearly given. Um, in the last few weeks I've been in America, 
I've come across in meeting people and talking with people, I've I've come across typical Americanisms such as you have to understand me as I am. We have to understand people as they are. Just yesterday I was hearing someone say this that you know I, I like people to understand me as I am. But the poor man, the foolish man, doesn't realize he himself doesn't understand who he is. He only thinks he understands who he is. That's why he has to understand Bhagavad Gita as it is, so that he can understand who he is and what he is. He says, you have to understand me as I am, means that here I am, I am a, a bundle of false ego, calm, crowed, lobe, moha, madha, matsarya, all the contaminated qualities. And I identify myself as this. In other words, I am totally foolish, completely in maya, identifying myself as a competitor to Krishna, a very foolish competitor to Krishna. And this is me. We identify. I am American. I am a software engineer. We have any software engineers here? By chance? Almost everyone, probably. It's another material designation. Lucky for you, you're not a uh, software engineer, Sanatanaha. It's only, it's only a temporary situation. We have good news for you. So, these are all temporary situations, but we identify with this, and we we think, this is me, and you should, everyone should understand me as I am, but this is the arrogance of the conditioned soul. It sounds like, well, you should understand me as I am, and we're being, you know, it's a reasonable kind of proposition. But this is actually an expression of arrogance on the part of the conditioned soul who his duty is to understand himself as he is according to the definition given by Krishna. His actual position is part and parcel of Krishna. And he may think that I'm like this, I have this kind of, I have this kind of nature, this kind of temperament, you have to understand me according to my nature. But that nature is only his conditioned nature. He, that nature, even if it's uh, easygoing, tolerant, suave, or whatever kind of qualities might be considered good in this material world, that nature is an expression of his... It's a, another thing we hear, I, I have to express myself. Now in India also, they've borrowed this. Express yourself, the air tell. You're all out of India, you don't know. The air tell, the, the cell phone, or whatever it is, not phone, the, the uh, phone company. They say, express yourself. In other words, use our phone and we'll get more money from you. And they, they express yourself. Uh, express your, what will you express? If, you're, if you are simply full of calm, crowd, love, moha, madha, matsarya, then express yourself means to express all your calm, crowd, low, moha, madha, matsarya. This, uh, like all this art, the, this idea of art, modern art, they, they put some blobs on some canvas and sell it for $10,000. It's absolutely just some mad, some madman's expression. Picasso, famous modern artist. A madman. Blew his brains out in the end. No, no, that was Van Gogh. So this whole idea, I have to express myself. You have to understand me as I am. Yes, we do understand you as you are, but you don't understand. We understand from Bhagavad Gita that you are a part and parcel of Krishna and it is your duty to surrender to Krishna. So we are, we are telling you who you are. We, this idea, I have to express myself, you have to understand me as I am. It's a, a statement of independence. But we are not independent. This message Krishna is giving in Bhagavad Gita, this idea that we are independent. America is the land of the free. Free? How free? What is the meaning of free? We're not free. 
as as Prabhupada writes in in here. Uh, well, he explains the manashashtani indriyani prakriti sthani karshati. We're struggling with the six senses, which include the mind. We're struggling this idea that we have uh, karshati. Prabhupada says grappling with. He gives this term grappling with. It's just like you you'll see uh, an animal tied to a to a lead or a rope. And he's struggling and pulling and trying to get free, but so he has some freedom to move. If the rope is ten feet long, he has ten feet freedom. If the rope is two feet long, he has very little freedom. Sometimes there's a very long rope. The cows are put on a very long rope, maybe fifty feet or something, and he has some freedom. He can wander and and graze, but only as far as that rope, and no further. So he may think, I am free, until he's walking, munching the grass. I am free, until he gets to the 50-foot limit, and then, and then it's pulling on his neck. So this idea, the land of the free, how free? Free to indulge in sense gratification, but not free fr- from birth and death. Where is the freedom? The freedom to commit sinful activities and then uh, be forced to take a resultant body. So, this such freedom, freedom for foolish persons is not a good idea. Just like how much freedom do you want to give to your two-year-old child? Freedom to run in the street? And if if you'll run in this, he'll run, the door's open, he'll go outside you pull him back and he'll start, ah, why are you restricting my freedom? Why? Because he's not responsible. He'll run in the street and get killed. He doesn't know how to act for his own benefit. So, to give freedom to one who does not know how to act for his own benefit, they may think, well, that's very good, we're the land of the free, but that's not at all beneficial. That is rather opposite to the actual interest of the of the person to give them freedom. Rather, the persons who are ignorant of their own self-interest should be disciplined and educated. And discipline comes first. Because there's no education without discipline. Just like if you let the child run in the street, first of all, he'll kill himself. And then you, there's nothing, then, then, then what will you educate? But uh, the, the, the nature that I shall run freely and do whatever I like but education means you have to sit and listen and absorb. One has to, some discipline is required. So discipline comes first, and then comes education. But in the modern age, there's this idea: we are, we should be free. Well, who's free? Who's free? Everyone's working. Long out here, we're all, we're all uh, bound up to some company. Your freedom means you have a little. You have. They might give you enough time to brush your teeth and eat something and sleep a little bit. And all the, you're a slave of the company. So where is the freedom? They've, they've promoted this idea of women's liberation. Women should be as free as men. To do what? To, to go and work in some factory or company? What, 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 what kind of freedom is that? In, instead, of, instead of being uh, in the home working, then they're going out to the workplace and working. And it, is it such a wonderful thing that the men, the men are thinking, oh, it's so wonderful, I have to go to work. No, no one's got to work. They're, they're, when you get a job contract, you see how much holidays you get. Isn't it? You don't, you don't protest. That only three weeks, holidays, three weeks holidays a year? I only want two days because I want to work. No one wants to work. Only because you're getting the money. So what, this, this idea we're getting, women are being given freedom. It's not freedom. You know, it's, where's the freedom? You, Working, that's not free. And the jiva doesn't have freedom. This, uh, this whole idea of freedom, it's, just, it's a misnomer. We, we have the freedom to choose to serve Krishna or to serve Maya. And if we serve Maya, then we become the servants of someone else. Everyone is trying to be the boss. And in, in a country, there's one president and everyone is underneath him. In, in a company, there's one boss and everyone, there may be some bosses but everyone is dependent on everyone else. But ultimately, 
There is only one controller, Ekale Ishvara Krishna, Ara Sabha Jare Joichai Nachai Tare Toichai Kare Nritta. There is only one actual controller, and that is Krishna. Even the, the president of the country or the president of Microsoft or whatever, they're all, everyone is controlled. Who is free? Who is actually controlling? They control you to some, the, the, the boss of the company controls to some extent by money. If you work, you get the money. If you don't work, you don't get the money. And if you don't behave yourself in the workplace, if you then you're fired and you don't get the money. So, they're exercising some kind of control over you. But they themselves are controlled. The president of the company today, he cannot control, he cannot say, in my next life I shall also be the president of the company. There's no, there's no such guarantee. He, he, even he may say, may think, well, I, I'm, I'm in this position, I'd like to remain. He cannot remain. He can build a huge house with all kinds of gadgets in it. But he cannot remain in that house. Of course, if he's very much attached to it, he can take birth in the same house again. That may happen by the laws of nature. Just like, for instance, once in Stockholm, Srila Prabhupada was being shown a rented a, a building that the devotees had just rented, which they were going to use for a temple. So he opened one door, and a rat ran through. Prabhupada said, that was the previous owner of the house. <laughs> he was attached to it. He wanted to live in this house, in my house. So as a rat, he also thinks my house. He maintains the same consciousness. But living in this house, he's likely to get caught in a rat trap. Of course, the devotees, they don't keep... Well, they may, but not, not a killer rat trap. So, if we're very much attached to a place, we may take birth there again. But we're not free to choose how or in what situation. We can simply dream of that. People daydream. I, in our daydream, we may think, I shall be very rich. I shall be very famous. I shall be very powerful. But it's only... A daydream. It's so this whole idea that you have to accept me as I am, or, or, or you you have to understand me as I am, or I, I relate to me as I am. This idea that I'm like this, and you shouldn't try to change me. You should adjust to me. But no, you are in a wrong position. Accept you as you are. No. In a wrong position. Envious of Krishna. We're preaching Bhagavad Gita as it is so that people can understand who they actually are. You don't know who you are. We don't accept you as you are. Krishna doesn't accept you. If we are covered with material desires, Krishna doesn't accept this. So instead of thinking, you have to accept me as I am, placing myself at the center. We should rather understand that Krishna is the center and we have to adjust ourselves to Him. Not that we expect that it's very reasonable that other people should adjust themselves to me, but rather we should adjust ourselves to Krishna. This is a completely different way of looking at the world, isn't it? Who is thinking like this? Even in religion, so-called religion, People are, it's just like the, people take a religion like a job, you see. Let's have a look. What Microsoft is offering this job, and another company is offering another job. What's in it for me, we're thinking, isn't it? And if the one who, that gives the best pay and the best perks, that's the job I'll do. What are the working facilities? What are the career prospects? We examine it and we... Of course, most mostly we, we're just running, begging for a job, as Prabhupada said that. The universities are turning out dogs because they have to go running from door to door. Please give me a job. I have my certificate. Please give me a job. So it may, but so we're looking for a job, but we, we try to find that which is will give us the best facilities. So religion like that also. People are looking. What this one? What what? 
What are they promising? What will be in it for me? Just like this Mormon church is becoming very popular nowadays. It has been for many years. And it's actually a completely rubbish philosophy, even more than ordinary Christianity, which is pretty pretty bad. I mean, we don't say that publicly, but their idea that someone at some point Someone ate an apple, and because of that, the whole human race has to suffer. But then God came, and he, he was killed. God was killed. And whoever believes that is saved, and whoever doesn't burns in hell forever. I mean, it's a pretty pretty poor philosophy. I mean, I was brought up on it, and about by the age of 11 or so, I realized that it's pretty stupid. Pretty foolish idea, but Mormonism is even even more ridiculous. They have more revelations, and they they say you go to heaven and then you you live there with your family members, your grandmother, your grandfather, your uncles. But but the thing is that you want your grandmother to be grandmother age, and your grandmother wants to be young. So how do they resolve that? They never even think. So, but nevertheless, it's becoming very popular because it it offers some kind of social support. They they make sure everyone gets a job. They look after them nicely, and they're prosperous. And so, it's becoming very popular. Although theologically, it's even more bankrupt than ordinary Christianity. But people are looking to see what's in it for me. What do I get out of it? That if I go to, if I in, if I go to this Baba or Bapa, they'll give me some blessing. Sometimes I, I heard someone said this. I came to Iskon, I tried it for some time, but still all my problems remained the same. So I went to Shirdi, and all my problems were solved. So this is the real thing. And people think, well, that's real religion, because you see, I got some, I got some real blessings at Shirdi. But when I came to Iskon, all my problems continued. Someone was asking me just this just the other day, why does Krishna make it so difficult for us to come to him? But actually, this is, he doesn't make it difficult. Only we perceive it as difficult because we have the idea that God's duty is to give us a massage. And God, he should come and wake us up in the morning by singing sweet songs in our ears. And he should fan us and... Uh, Whenever we call him, hey, come here, come here. He should come running and bow down at our feet. Order supplier. I say, dear God, I have, you know, I have a lot of problems. I have all these debts. Could you do something about it? And we think that's God's duty to do that. But rather, our duty is to surrender to him. And we say, why does he, he make it so difficult to come to him? We see it as difficult because we think that... Uh, life, everything is supposed to be made comfortable for me, and that's God's duty. We don't perceive that this material world, it is by its very nature difficult as long as we are in the consciousness of considering that I am the enjoyer, then definitely we'll find the material world very difficult because this world is not a place of enjoyment. And we can only get very limited enjoyment at the expense of much suffering. Whatever enjoyment, what is their enjoyment? You can drive in a in a big Lincoln limousine, but then how much you have to work and uh, to to get that car, and how much anxiety? Someone puts a little dent in it, and you get so upset. And and it's uh, it's enjoyable to be healthy and play sports, but then how much how much Exercise. How much effort you have to be put? You have to put in these Olympic athletes. They're they're under a complete regime, isn't it? They, they, what time they go to sleep and what they eat and how much they eat and the vitamin pills they have to take and the training they have to do. And all of them, except one, loses anyway. After all that training, and you you go finally you get in the 800 meters race or whatever it is. And after all that training for so many years, trying to be successful, at the end, only one of them is happy, and all the rest are lamenting. So, where's the, where's the happiness? What's the? Of course, India. They, they in some games, I think they won a bronze medal or something. Was it in some? 
shooting in the Olympic Games. When was that? Last, last Olympic. Last Olympic. India at last, the second most populous country in the world, at last won a medal, bronze medal. And so he becomes famous. So, some consolation prize. So, uh, anyway, this material world, it's simply full of suffering. We, we, we try so hard to fulfill our aims, and we're always frustrated because our aim isn't fulfilled. And then when it is fulfilled, we're also frustrated because it doesn't bring us the happiness that we desire. Just like how many of you um, were excited about coming to America, thinking how wonderful it would be, and afterwards you had a different opinion. Anyone? Not everyone. Some of you thought it stinks, even before you came. What did you come for? <laughs> but generally we think, it will be wonderful. I will come to America, it, I will earn lots of money, and it will be wonderful. And in some ways it is wonderful. I mean, in general, it's cleaner than India. The streets are cleaner and maybe less noisy and there are so many different advantages. In but uh, it's not as hot. It's pretty cold. But it's not as hot. So you can escape the heat, but you can't escape the cold. But however nice it may be, it doesn't add up to happiness. By having money and a nice house, it doesn't equal happiness. So that is the... Rather, we find that we have... Even coming here, we have so many difficulties. So if we think that, well, it's so much difficulty to be Krishna conscious, actually... All these difficulties that we perceive, all the difficulties that we perceive in the material world are because we think that this material world is a place of our enjoyment. And if we understand that I'm only meant to serve Krishna, then we see that material obstacles which are always there, we just see, well, I have to serve Krishna in this situation, whether it's easy or not easy, I have to serve Krishna. And whatever situation Krishna gives, well, that's his mercy upon me. And then, difficulties don't become difficult. We, we perceive it as a difficulty because we think, I am the doer. Kartaham prakritei kriyamanani gunai karmani sarvashaha ahankara vimurhatma kartaham iti manyate We're under the control of the three modes of material nature. But we think, I am the doer. Therefore we perceive this is difficult. But when we see, I am simply the servant of Krishna, we try to serve Krishna to the best of our abilities, and then Krishna helps. Or, by Krishna's grace, the situation may become more difficult. If we're, It may become more difficult so that we can understand that as long as I'm thinking it's difficult, it means I'm... Difficult means uh, I'm desiring that I should live a very comfortable life and if there's some obstacle to my comfort, therefore I perceive difficulty. I should lead a very happy life, I should enjoy all my senses. There's some obstacle to my sense gratification, therefore I perceive it as difficult. But when we understand that we're only meant to serve Krishna, then whether we understand Krishna in a very easy way or a, or a less or, or a more challenging manner anyway we have to serve Krishna so what is the difficulty? It is our duty to serve Krishna like a, like a sold out animal this example is given that the sold out animal he whether he has to bear a light load or a heavy load he has no choice he has to serve so we, we take this position understanding now we may say, well, why should we accept such difficulty to serve Krishna? But the fact is that this material world is full of difficulty by its very nature. By the nature of our contaminated consciousness that we want to enjoy it, conversely, we have to accept so many difficulties. 
But if we understand that we are the servant of Krishna, then there is no difficulty. Everything is simply blissful. And even the so-called difficulties become source of bliss for the devotee, that Krishna is giving me the opportunity to serve him in this way. Arjuna wanted to avoid the difficulty of fighting. And Krishna told him, no, you fight. Think of me and fight. So, when, as long as Arjuna was thinking that I, I have to fight, this will be against my own self interest this will be against what I want, then Arjuna was suffering. But when he understood that now I have to fight for Krishna, then the same fighting which Arjuna saw as the source of unlimited unhappiness for him became the source of his unlimited bliss because he did it in Krishna's service. Just like if someone has to carry out garbage, that's not considered a very high-class job. To, to be a garbage cleaner. What do they call him in America? They probably have some euphemistic name. They, they always try to change. Sanitation engineer? Is it? No, they don't call it an engineer. That's a good guess. Janitor? Janitor? Yeah. Well, I was thinking of those who go around with the big trucks. Municipal... Municipal... Uh, Waste manager or something like that. Not waste, a mu- municipal cleanliness upholder or something like this. They have all these euphemistic terms. Abortion becomes pregnancy termination. And spastic becomes physically challenged person. And a short person becomes a vertically challenged person. They have all these, they have all these funny names. Anyway... Taking out the garbage, it's not considered enjoyable, is it, to have to do that as a job? But doing it for Krishna becomes a source of bliss. I can tell two anecdotes in this regard. I was mercifully allowed to join this movement at Bhaktivedanta Manor in England. And at that time, there was one devotee staying there who was very mild by nature, very Brahminical by nature, sattvic, we can use that term. And he was respected. He was a senior devotee and he would do preaching programs in schools and he would, when groups of people came to the manor, he would show them around. He would do dramas like this. So one day the town president asked him, Prabhu, Please take out the garbage, which you wouldn't expect a senior, respected, Brahminically inclined devotee to be asked to take out the garbage. So he said, okay, where is it? So he said, actually, I don't want you to take out the garbage. Someone else can do it. But I just wanted to see whether you are a Brahmana or a Vaishnava. Brahmana will think, I'm very pure. I shall not do this. This is below me. Nowadays, I heard that in Tamil Nadu now, because the uh, the Brahmanas, it's like reversed. They they're like socially like they're like the bottom caste. They can't get any job or any such thing. So, so some are uh, carrying the dead bodies because they don't get any other job. Brahmana cannot imagine doing such things, but he has his children too. He has to see how to feed them. And others ch- and others are changing their names so that no one can understand their Brahmin, so they can get some so like this. So Brahmin will not like to do that, but a devotee will like to do. Another anecdote I'm telling, that uh, Dhanavi Maharaj, you may know him, he told me this, that uh, when he first came to the temple, it was before he joined, um, he came with some philosophical questions. I think it was in San Francisco. Long ago, of course. So the devotees there were all mostly very new, and they said, philosophical questions, go and ask Jayananda Prabhu, the famous Jayananda Prabhu. So they said, well, 
where is he? And they said, well, at this time of day, he's probably taking out the garbage. He was the most senior devotee. He did all the different services. He was the most senior, but he did all kinds of services. So he went out he, under the direction. He, he found out where to go, went out the back, saw Jayananda, most senior devotee. Actually, physically older than most of them. Most of the devotees were in their early 20s, and he was almost 40 years old. So he... And... Danavir, at that time, his name was... I don't know what it was, something else. So... Uh, he saw him looking so effulgent. He said, and he forgot all his other questions and said, How are you so happy? He said, I don't have time to think about that. I'm just busy in this service. Here, you help too. See that garbage? Here, help me take it out. And then immediately he did that and he also felt the happiness of serving Krishna. So even though he's the most sinner, he was quite happy to take out the garbage. Because Samalo Shtashmakantana in Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna twice says that one who is in transcendental knowledge sees gold, uh, pebbles, and stone as the same. He's as the same means he's not attached to it for himself. If someone gives him gold, he'll use it in Krishna's service, but he's not attached to it for himself. He, he has no personal attachment or detachment. He's in neither attraction or repulsion. He just sees how everything can be used in Krishna's service. So, in this way, this is samabuddhi, samadarshan, seeing everything equally because not being attached to anything in this world. If we're not attached to anything in this world, then we don't find difficulty. Difficulties are given by Krishna to his devotees. That's generally true. What we say, what we perceive as difficulties, that is to help to purify us. That is to help to purify us of the consciousness that this is difficulty, this is a strain for me, this is a struggle for me. To purify us of the consciousness of that I am supposed to enjoy this material world and to instill in us the consciousness that we are meant to do anything and everything, whatever is required to serve Krishna. And we perceive it as a difficulty because as long as we are not fully surrendered to Krishna. Of course, even a great pure devotee like Srila Prabhupada, he went through so many difficulties. And all the devotees, if we see Srimad Bhagavatam, who are the great devotees described there? Prahlad Maharaj, Ambarish Maharaj, Dhruva Maharaj. This. Now, all their activities are full of difficulty, isn't it? And if there wasn't difficulty, then how would you know what is the character of Prahlad Maharaj? There are so many devotees who may sit pulling on their malas, So you may think, very great devotee, but how will you know? Sitting, chanting, that may be one way uh, of maintaining oneself because people think, oh, great devotee. Give him a house, give him food, feed him nicely, respect him. It may be. There may be many persons who are apparently devotees, but doing so for the comfort that that position provides. Even if they're living an austere life, I mean, not eating very much and not you know, living without much money, but it's a cloistered life away from the, away from the pandemonium, pandemonium of, this, of the material struggle. They have no material struggle. They simply sit very nicely. So, that is not necessarily true in all cases, but that can also be a kind of sense gratification, avoiding the difficulty of the world, and you do a little chanting, and at least in India, people will give enough so that you can survive, and you can be peaceful. There are many sadhus like that, who mostly, 
Monang Charanti Vijane Naparata Nishtaha. They they sometimes they accept the vow of silence, but they're not uh, they're not concerned with uplifting others. They're just yes, I'm peaceful, I'm comfortable. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. My Shanti and I'm very happy. But are they actually advanced in spiritual consciousness, thinking thinking of the welfare of others? It doesn't appear so. And they may be very materially attached also. It may be that they have very little possessions, but they're, they're, whatever little they have, they're very attached to it, or they're very attached to prestige. Sometimes people become very austere and they renounce many things just so that people will respect them. So they, they're not collecting physical objects, but they're collecting respect, which is just as mundane, if not more so. The, the, the pride of being respected is at least as much a contamination of that of trying to enjoy the, the gross sense objects. In fact, it's worse because it's hypocrisy, because one is posing as a sadhu just to get respect. So, difficulties, what we perceive as difficulties, are offered to the conditioned souls who are striving to be devotees to purge them, as Srila Bhaktisthan Sarasri Thakur says, to purge them in the fire of ordeal. Just like Gold is purified by fire. So this, this, the jiva is by nature pure. But now is apparently associated with impurities. That is to be burned out in the fire of ordeal. And for pure devotees, difficulties are there. Just to demonstrate what is the character of a pure devotee. That he will not be a traitor. Even in great difficulty, in under the threat of life, even, he will not renounce his devotion to the Supreme Lord. This we sing Radha Krishna Pranamo Jugala Kisho Jivane Marane Gati Arnahima. Radha Krishna are my life. In life or death, I have no other goal. Or Maro bi Rako bi Jovit Chatoha Nitadasa Prati Tua Adhika. Dear Krishna, you can kill me or protect me as you like. I am simply your sold out devotee. Uh, I'm, I'm your. So you have that right over me. I, I surrender to myself to you. So that that platform is to be aspired for. That that is the pure platform. It's, it's an easy thing to say. Not such an easy thing to do. But actually, this platform is of detachment. Samaloshtashma kanchana. This this is the actual platform of happiness. As long as we are attached to anything in this material world, we feel distress because we are afraid someone will take it away or it deteriorates or we are in anxiety for it or we want more. Material attachment is the cause of distress. And if we are detached, then we don't experience the suffering of na shochati na kangshati. Brahma Bhuta Prasanna Atma Na Shochati Na Kangshati If you're on the spiritual platform of detachment from everything material, then we don't lament for that which we have lost or that which we think we could have attained. Oh, if I had done that, I would have got this. And we don't desire, we don't hanker, I should get this, I should get that. And in any situation, stira bhuti asangurha, fixed consciousness, not bewildered, 
because detached means we have nothing to aspire for in, for our own sense gratification in this material world. And we know that Krishna is in control. So whatever happens is under Krishna's control. And my duty is to try to strive to serve Krishna. And if things go nicely, they go very smoothly, we make a plan, we shall do this in the service of Krishna, and everything goes very nice, very nice, very good. And if there are many obstacles and difficulties, which almost inevitably there will be, in any endeavor in this material world, and especially if we try to do something good, Shreyangsi Bahu Vignani. If there's some Shreya or, or exalted goal, then automatically Bahu Vignani. There will be so many obstacles. But a devotee is detached because he doesn't think I'm the doer or I have anything to enjoy here, but he simply tries to serve Krishna to the best of his ability. Now, detached, what does that mean? Devotee is not so detached that that uh, he sees someone coming to steal from the temple and he's simply Om Shanti. He will simply watch. Someone comes and takes away the donation box and I'm detached. No, he becomes very angry. Stop him, rascal, thief. Why? There's a story of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sartako. He was lecturing about detachment from this world. And later in the day, he was uh, writing in his study, and someone had come to visit, and they'd put some bananas, they'd offered some bananas, so some bananas were sitting there. And suddenly a monkey jumped in the room and grabbed the bananas, and Bhaktisthan Sastri jumped up to try to stop the banana, and in the course of doing that, his ink pot spilled over, and all the writing that he'd done went all over the ink pot. And one of his disciples, hearing the commotion, came in and saw this, and said that, Guru Maharaj, in the morning you were talking about detachment, but now you became so upset with this banana, this monkey stealing a few bananas, that you uh, you jumped up, and then all your writing became spoiled. And then, What's this? He had the foolishness to ask. But Bhaktisthan Sarsar Thakur explained that those bananas were meant for offering to the Lord. He wasn't thinking, my bananas. He never thought. But no, this is for the service of the Lord. The monkey should not take. It should be offered to Krishna. Everything should be offered to Krishna. So a devotee may appear to be very attached. Srila Prabhupada, he was... Uh, in the early Back to Godhead magazine, that means before he even came to America, he wrote that many people are surprised seeing my activities because I came to live in Vrindavan, but I spend most of my time running up and down to Delhi and purchasing paper and, and then, then going to different printers, getting quotations. And it appears that I'm just, I'm engaged in business just as I previously was. So what kind of sadhu is this? Engaged in pound, shillings and pence business. But he explained that this is completely transcendental because it's only for the service of Krishna. This magazine is only meant for preaching for Krishna. So in uh, promoting a, a magazine like Back to Godhead, one will experience the same kind of travails that one will if one is printing Playboy magazine or any other magazine. The, the, the same kind of thing. You have to see quality of paper, and then circulation, and then, uh, then uh, financial matters, legal matters. So many things have to be considered. And it may appear that a devotee is engaged in a similar way to that of a materialist. And it is similar. But the intent is completely different. Because the intent of the materialist is how I shall enjoy by this endeavor. And the in intent of the devotee is how shall I satisfy Krishna by this endeavor. So in any endeavor, there will be difficulties. 
But a devotee is detached in as much as he knows that, well, this is, this is Krishna's will for me. He doesn't see any difficulty as a, as an obstacle to his sense gratification, but he endeavors very hard to overcome the obstacles. And if people, due to their uh, foolishness or obstinacy or pig-headedness, try to make some obstacle to the service of Krishna, he becomes upset. The body may become upset. To uh, why you're making such a difficulty, why you are obstructing, not for his own sense gratification, but for the service of Krishna. We see the Prabhupada often became upset. He would shout at his disciples, You rascal! And they would... Devastating experience. Why? Prabhupada was so attached? No. Not attached to this material world, but attached that this jiva who has come to me should learn how to serve Krishna properly. Any error suggests lack of proper consciousness, lack of the proper consciousness that I am doing everything for Krishna. So a devotee endeavors very hard in the service of Krishna. Just as the materialist endeavors very hard for sense gratification, the body endeavors very hard in the service of Krishna. But at the same time, there's an inner sense of detachment. Nothing for his own sense gratification. Madhavendra Puri, living a very renounced life, then Gopal came to him in deity form. Now you serve me. For himself, he never made any endeavor even for his bodily maintenance. Ayachit vritti. He, never, he would never ask anyone, I'm hungry, give me food. As a sadhu, sannyasi, he is, by social right, he has the right to beg, to go to people's house and beg. That you please give something, I need to eat. Even he doesn't need to say, he just needs to go and hold out his bowl and people will give. They understand sannyasi. But he wouldn't do that. If people would automatically come to him, he would eat. And if not, he wouldn't. That's all. But he would go on chanting Hare Krishna in any circumstance. So for himself, he didn't want to make any endeavor. Because he wanted to spend all his time in hearing and chanting about Krishna. But then when Gopal ordered him in a dream that you go from Vrindavan to Puri, which is a long way to go. Even now it's like 36 hours by train. And if you have to walk, it's more than 36 days. So, so much difficulty. He went on the order of the Lord. Go and bring me sandalwood pulp. Sandalwood. Not sand, not pulp. Bring me sandalwood from Puri. So immediately he set out. For himself, no endeavor. But for the Lord, prepared to go, undergo any amount of endeavor. That is the nature of a devotee. So, Krishna consciousness means completely different consciousness from that of the materialist. Devotee endeavors, the materialist endeavors. The devotee endeavors for the service of Krishna. And devote, devotee endeavors for the service of Krishna. Non-devotee endeavors for his own sense gratification, seeing himself as the center. This is the cause of his bondage in material life is the cause of his unlimited suffering. And devotee by the same, by similar endeavor, achieves eternal blissful life in the service of Krishna. Hare Krishna. Any question about this? When we engage different facilities in Krishna's service, then... Uh we also get to use these and uh, sometimes there may be risk of just experiencing pleasure in, in uh, using these things in Krishna's service. Mm. So, <laughs> what to do? The risk. We take so many things to use in Krishna's service. We may live in a nice building, nice, have nice computers or cars and so many things. 
Therefore we have to discuss topics as we are discussing this evening. I am not the enjoyer. I am to be enjoyed by Krishna. These facilities are not meant for my own personal enjoyment. They are meant for the service of Krishna. You have to hear again and again. Otherwise the tendency is to, due to our perverted mentality, our tendency is to take anything and consider how we can use it for our own enjoyment. We have to be very careful. We take everything for Krishna's service. In family life also, family life is generally entered into for personal enjoyment. But in Krishna conscious family life is entered into for the service of Krishna. Krishna Shamsha Karo Charyanacha. Enter Krishna's family, Bhaktivinoda you know, Thakur says, and give up all bad behavior. Even in Vedic culture, one even uh, one may not be directly a devotee of Krishna, but marriage is undertaken not primarily for karma, for personal enjoyment, but for dharma. duty, responsibility. Putrarte kriyate bharya putra pinda prayojana It is a duty for a, a person on the in the karma to, for a man to accept a wife for the sake of having a son who can offer pinda or oblations to the forefathers. There's a duty to the forefathers. So it's undertaken as a duty and it's also expected that there will be some karma there. Dharma, Artha, Kama. These are the three varga or the three goals or guiding principles of persons in Vedic culture. And those who are more advanced also become interested in moksha, and those who are on an altogether better platform, they aspire for Pancham Purusharta, the, the fifth goal beyond Dharma, Artha, Kama and Moksha, which is uh, simply to serve Krishna, to attain Krishna Prem. Krishna Bishoyak Prem, Pancham Purusharta, Jara Age Chunatulla Chari Purusharta. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said that Prem, transcendental love, centered on Krishna, is the fifth goal above Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha. And in comparison to this Prem, all these Dharma, Artha, Kama, and Moksha, which is very high level compared to persons who are not following this then it is as insignificant as straw in the street. Hmm. So, I, it would seem that most of you, especially after coming from India to America, can begin to appreciate more what is, what is Indian culture, isn't it? It's the religious culture, you, you tend to appreciate it more in a land where the atmosphere is completely different. But we should know that the, the ultimate and actual goal of that culture is to attain love of Krishna. We should also understand what is Indian culture and what isn't. It's like coming here, then Indians, many of them, they be, well, some of them become like almost completely Americanized. And others like to maintain their sense of Indianness. And that may be part of the reason for coming to Krishna Consciousness. But actually Krishna Consciousness is not Indianness. And not everything Indian is Krishna Conscious. Just like uh, Bollywood movies and songs. Of course in South India they have their own stars. 
Rajani Khan, this old man now in Tamil Nadu. Tamil Nadu's other great contribution to Indian culture. Sri Devi. Actually, that's true. Sri Devi ultimately means Lakshmi, but if you say Sri Devi in India today, people don't think of Lakshmi Devi. They think of some retired Bollywood heroine. Brahmin. Ayanga. So, uh, this is a, a this is not laudable. It is not that everything in Indian culture, what is going on in Indian culture today, it's not that we should take it all. We should know what is to be accepted and what isn't. It's like I was saying, Shirdi. You may, say, you may be surprised that we go to Shirdi and you get what you want. And you come to Krishna and you don't get what you want. So then you may think, well, why not go to Shirdi? The answer is because by getting what we want in our foolish condition, we ultimately get what we don't want, which is repeated, <laughs> which is repeated birth and death. Plus the offense of going to someone else than Krishna. So, if we are sincere to serve Krishna, then we can get what our heart actually desires, which is love of Krishna. But mostly everyone's thinking, what do I get? What will I get? From religion also. That's why Krishna consciousness is not a religion in the ordinary sense of the term. When we, when we, generally when we think of religion, we again we think, what do I get? What's in it for me? But real religion means a complete turnaround of consciousness to understand, Mamai Vangsho Jiva Loke, Jiva Bhuta Sanatana. I am a servant of Krishna. My only real self-interest is in the service of Krishna. And as long as I think that I have any Shreya or actual self-interest in anything else but unalloyed service to Krishna, then we are actually acting against our own self-interest and causing our suffering. So as long as we don't understand this, then we'll run around for, to Shirdi and then to some near ashram and uh, some Baba and all different kinds of things, running here and there, some Amma, all kind of... What's in it for me? What are they giving? Oh, Amma embraces us and so much love. But Amma, so-called, cannot protect from birth and death. And her so-called love is completely useless. It's worse than useless because it is a purported substitute for the real love, which is real love of Krishna. What we call love in this material world is how someone can relieve me of my tension and give me sense gratification. That's not love at all. It's another form of cheating. If we think that if we purport to make people happier or better without love of Krishna, it's just simply another form of cheating. Just like you go to a psychologist and they, may, they try to make you feel relaxed or you go to some, to some yoga group so you can relax and feel more peaceful. But all this, it's all simply cheating. As long as we we may feel more peaceful. We think, well, I definitely got some benefit from that. So, uh, so you go to meditation classes, yeah, and you're feeling more relaxed, and people, yeah, yeah. So I, I'm really getting something from it. What are you getting from it? It's just another form of forgetfulness of Krishna. But it feels beneficial because we're thinking my mind should be relaxed and I should be happy in this material world. So we're thinking I'm benefiting, but actually we're not benefiting. It's the opposite of benefiting because. We're increasing our sense of being happy in this material world, which is an obstacle to our surrender to Krishna. So what we think is our benefit is not. And the difficulty is actually of this material world is actually good if, we under, if it helps us to realize that I'm not meant to be here anyway. I'm not meant to be trying to enjoy this material world. I'm meant to be serving Krishna. Hmm. Our actual blissful life is with Krishna. There's no other happiness. 
That is our position. Namai Bhavashad Jiva Loka, Jiva Bhuta Sanatana. And everything else, whether it's peace of mind or understanding me as I really am and don't be judgmental and all these platitudes, it's all simply manashashtan indriyani prakritisthani kaushati. It's simply uh, a different permutation of the struggle within this material world which binds us here and causes us to forget Krishna more and more and more. So just this little thing we can understand is revolutionary. Even Krishna worship, what generally goes on in Krishna worship, it's also conceived of for personal sense gratification. I will worship Krishna and I will feel very happy doing so. And as long as I'm feeling happy, I shall do so. And when not, then I'll stop. Just like we see, previously in India, people used to be very religious. But then the TV came, and they're all watching the TV. And all the different soap operas and spots. We find at our ISKCON temples in India, Sometimes I go and uh, I say, why are there so few people here coming to the lecture? Cricket match. India versus Pakistan. So when it's over, then more people will come to the temple. Because they're thinking that watching the cricket match, that's better sense gratification than going to the temple. I like to go to the temple. That's also nice. But there's, a, there's an important match so I have to watch that, and then afterwards we'll again go to the temple. And yet we also go to the temple. Every Friday we go to the temple and with the family, and Saturday we go to the movies. You see, so we're very pious. So, balanced, you see. Balanced. Balanced. Not too much. So, as long as we don't hear all these topics, then we can never actually understand what Krishna consciousness is what our real purpose of life is. Even people go, they like to hear, they like to go to, they'll, you'll find lakhs of people turn up if there's some famous speaker who'll tell nice stories about Krishna, but their life won't change. They'll, they, they won't change their life even slightly afterwards. They don't want to change. That's why lakhs of people go. Because Manushanam Sahasreshu Kastrid Yatati Sita Yatatama Pisitanam Kastrin Maham Veti Tatvata. They don't want to know Krishna. They just want to hear some nice stories for their own sense gratification, pious sense gratification. They're not actually interested in serving Krishna and surrendering to Krishna. So this Bhagavad Gita as it is, this should be distributed, this should be studied, and understand the purport. It's horrific to the conditioned soul. I have to surrender to Krishna. He doesn't perceive it as very nice, but actually it's the only it's the only source of actual benefit for him. It's just like the the child if, if the doctor is to give an injection uh, it's not very nice. He doesn't realize it's for my benefit. So actually in Krishna consciousness there's, there's nothing not enjoyable. Just dancing, chanting, serving Krishna, associating with devotees. But when we, when we think that I have to give up sense gratification then we are oh, so horrible. But actually, that is the that is the actual bliss for the devotee to not have any personal desires, but only desire to serve Krishna. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare.